Hi, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. I've been focused on COVID-19 since early 2020. I'd focused on autoimmunity as being the primary mechanism for severe disease. And throughout that time, I've had the pleasure to speak with experts, scientists, doctors, um, lawyers, multiple angles around COVID-19. One of the most important discussions that I had was in early 2021 with Gert van den Bosch. And this discussion really had an impact on a number of people. I'm only realizing at this point how many people had seen that video and it changed their perspective of the pandemic. And they are really appreciative of what Gert did at that point. The truth is not everyone agrees with Gert, but based on my experience, I know that his heart is in it. And I have not yet come across, in my experience, someone with this level of knowledge and understanding to be able to make predictions. One of the problems I think that has happened is that um, predictions are not always easy to make. And as I reflected on what to say here, and I realized that Gert has made some more predictions, I, I look at it like a volcano. And he made this analogy as well. You can see all the things that are happening around the volcano. You can see the pressure building, the carbon dioxide rising, the little tremors. You know it's going to blow, but you're just not able to specify which hour and which day. But at some point, this volcano is going to blow. And this is primarily what I think Gert is saying. In his view, this is going to happen very, very soon. And so he is talking about this largely because if this is going to explode, you have villages around the volcano. You can't wait for the lava to start pouring out to try and evacuate. You therefore have to try and make some degree of a prediction that you cannot necessarily guarantee the timing of. But if you wait until you see the lava, it is probably too late. And at this point, he is raising awareness of this very, very important transition, where in his view, it seems that this is inevitable. Before I go any further, I have clipped a short piece where Gert was speaking, and it highlights to me just how important this is to him. Take a listen to it, and then we'll come back to try and looking at some of the complexities of the science. Let me be very, very clear. The damage will be enormous. And as I was saying, I can be excused for missing the timeline. I cannot be excused for conveying a message that is completely wrong. But somebody, somebody has to do it. And I, I don't like to do this, not at all. I have tears in my eyes when I say this, but you know, it is reality, it is reality. We have come to the point where GN1 is telling us it's the harbinger you know, of, of uh, a new variant that will dramatically change the, the scene, just like Omicron did. Luckily enough for Omicron, it was just about the infectiousness. For the new one, it will be about the virulence. And uh, so for me, it's very clear recess is over, you know, playtime is over. And uh, for me, all the discussions, all other discussions are at this point obsolete. This is the one that we don't control and that is evolving in an extremely dramatic way. And our public health authorities are doing as if nothing were. Just observing, looking where this is going, saying we have endemicity, we have herd immunity, we will need to live with the virus and we will do yearly, yearly vaccination. It is, I'm sorry to say this, I'm weighing my words, this is complete bullshit. It's dangerous bullshit what, uh, what they are, the, the kind of messages uh, they, are, uh, they are spreading. And uh, I'm, I'm also completely pissed off with all the scientists who are blindly blindly following this narrative and as i was saying they should do their elisa uh, elisas on these antibodies for example to see that these are not uh, truly neutralizing antibodies 
So, yes, so that was a clip from the interview, and you should look at the interview and listen to what he's saying. He was dealing with some very, very complex points. And as I said, what I did today, because I thought it was so important, is that um, I had a conversation here. So this is me and Dr. Rob Runnenbaum speaking about the um, the the interview and going into some of the detail around exactly what he was talking about, the non-neutralizing antibodies, polyreactive antibodies. And so if you want to take a look at that, that's 66 minutes long. So we spent some time really going into it. Please click on the link below to go to the Substack and take a look at some of our thoughts. I'm now going to be trying to break this down into as simple a way that I can because people need to try and understand what he's saying and why he's making reference to this. Where to start, I think, is with what caught Gert's attention. And this was uh, an article that was published in Forbes. And it was done by uh, William Hasseltine. Um, he's a, a PhD who worked at Harvard, really great experience um, with regards to multiple viral infections. And he has been following COVID very closely. And he describes the JN1 as being the odd man out. And so you can see here this red circle among all these squares. That's what he is referring to when he considers that this is the odd man out. This was published in about October of 2023. But there are some very important things that he highlighted from the research. And you have here, um, this is one of the images that he had showed. And it was showing that the BA286, which is another variant of Omicron, this was the one that we were concerned about before, uh, this one then splits into potentially three different times. And JN1, this is the one that has really got GERT really concerned. And there are some characteristics about this particular variant that is making him realize that something different is happening at the immune level. That's why he is concerned that we are on the brink of that eruption because the characteristics that are being seen are not necessarily typical. So when they looked in more detail at this JN1 variant, and they're looking at, they're comparing three different ones, the XBB15, the HV1, and the JN1 here. And these are the overlapping mutations that they've got here. But in terms of JN1, these are the numbers of unusual mutations that they were seeing. So it's, it's significantly different, even though it has similar characteristics in some parts. But it's more than just that JN1 is different. It's also the fact that even in the more recent neutralization um, tests, and you can see here as well, this is later in the article, you can see that when they look at neutralization here, um, when they're comparing the different um, mutations, the different uh, Omicron variants, I don't know if it's so easy to see. All you have to remember is that at the end here is JN1. And this titer here is the lowest. The immune response is the lowest to this JN1. And here again. So what it's meaning is that the, um, the antibodies that are being produced even after vaccination don't seem to be responding or being able to neutralize JN1. And that's only part of the problem that Gert is concerned about. And what he was trying to explain yesterday was just how significant this transition is with regards to why this is actually occurring. And he was pointing out that previously, you had antibodies being the primary response to the infection. What he's starting to realize is that it's no longer antibodies. And this is the part that he is, is very concerned about. And I've got this, um, this section here from his, um, his article. And uh, he was talking about the dominant propagation of JN1 suggests that the population's immune response no longer primarily consists of broadly 
cross um, cross S variant reactive antibodies, but of newly emerging immune effectors that are no longer S specific, but still immune um, exert immune pressure on the viral infection. And his theory is that this immune refocusing, where the immune system is doing a transition, has shifted from these cross reactive antibodies to cross um, ST2 reactive cytotoxic lymphocytes. Now, it, that's a lot of um, information in, in one bite. And so this is why I said I'm trying to see if I can break this down into simple ways. And in our discussion, I was asking Rob, how can I try and get some of these ideas across? So the way that I describe it is the immune system is like fighting a war. It's always doing that. That's its role. And when you think of an army, you can have different sections of the army. You have the uh, the Air Force, you have the, the Navy, you have the ground troops, and even the ground troops are split up into military, um, or they say the Marines or the paratroopers, uh, different groups of the, um, the army that does different things. So the way how antibodies work is that they almost operate from a distance. And so the example I have is a, a, a ship firing surface-to-air missiles to strike different points at um, um, of a target for your enemy, or it could be the, the, the Air Force, but they are doing this at a distance. And that's how the antibodies largely work. The plasma cells then will be producing antibodies in the lymph nodes, and the antibodies are then going and taking out the viruses. But it seems that the immune system is not coping well, certainly with regards to JN1. Because as you said, as we showed, the antibodies being produced are just not effective. You're dropping bombs, and it seems that the enemy are in bunkers. So nothing is touching them. So what do you have to then do? You then have to send in your ground troops. And that's what I describe as the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. They are the cells that go and target the infected cells, and they go into the caves, they go into the bunkers, and they then try to see if they can get the enemy out. Your problem is, and this is what Gert was saying, is that the, the, the switch of the immune system from the, the antibodies or the surface-to-air missiles to ground troops then means that you have to switch off your surface-to-air missiles because you can't have the troops on the ground going into bunkers and you're bombing them at the same time. And it is a combination of two things that is really getting him worried about the fact that we are right on the brink of this volcano exploding because it will mean that in highly vaccinated parts of the world the immune system is shifting to the T lymphocytes instead of antibodies and there may be problems still being able to neutralize this virus there's one other thing that's very very concerning to him and this is now where we're talking about the um the characteristics of the spike protein. And you have here, this is a, a number of angles of the spike protein. So this is one angle, this is it rotated to different direction. Uh, this here is looking at it from the top. Um, so one of the things about this is that where you have purple, this is what they call the N-terminal domain. It's not where the ACE2 binds to allow the spike to get the virus inside the cell. This is the re receptor binding domain. It's in green and yellow and blue. This is where ACE2 binds. But this portion, the N-terminal domain, is usually very well conserved. It doesn't change much, unlike the receptor binding domain. And what he's saying is that it seems that there are characteristics about JN1 that are altering this part of the spike protein. And so it's changing the immune response or the immune pressure now from the ground troops. These are the cytotoxic lymphocytes. It's now making the enemy shift to a guerrilla warfare. Instead of being in bunkers, they are now shifting to maybe being in trees because now they have a different target to look at. There's another point that is very important in this, and this is why I said this is so multi-layered that 
Um, the only person I think who could be doing this is Gert. You know, there are very few people who have looked in such detail and who have experience with regards to managing um, um, uh, viruses and looking at the impact of vaccines and so on. So his perspective is very, very important. The other thing that they noticed, which was in the um, in the recent paper that was the, the article, is that they have noticed that it is not just the spike protein that is being changed at the moment. They are now noticing that JN1 has changes to different parts of the virus. So this is the normal virus here. And you have here, this is just a, a virus with the blue part being the spike protein. And this is a cut section of the virus. So this is the spike protein. But this is not the only part of the virus that is immunogenic. You also have the nucleocapsid protein, you have membrane proteins, you have envelope proteins. And one of the problems with regards to vaccinations is that they were so focused on the spike as opposed to natural immunity, which focuses on all of these epitopes and proteins, is that changes to the spike allow the virus to get around it. What they're noticing with JN1 is that for the first time, they're seeing not just changes to the spike, but changes to other proteins in the virus. And this suggests to GERT that it means that the, the switch of the immune response to cytotoxic um, lymphocytes is causing the immune pressure to shift the whole virus in a way that it will completely evade immunity. Now, GERT still maintains that this is primarily a challenge for the vaccinated cohort. Um, it's one of the points that I'm not still not too sure about, and that's where we have a slight disagreement between myself and Gert. I think that this is potentially a risk across the whole population. And in that context, I think that we have to be very, very careful. And this is why I say that we are all in it together. But the point being made is that from an immune point of view, the unvaccinated cohorts still have all of their pieces working together. So the ground troops, the surface-to-air missiles, the Air Force, everything is working in a coordinated way. And so therefore they have an advantage as opposed to being completely safe. That's how I look at it. There is an advantage, but it doesn't mean that everything is absolutely okay. But for our vaccinated cohort, who are now using their last level of immune response by bringing in the ground troops, it could indicate that we have nowhere left to go. And so that brings me to a very important piece of the discussion when I, I, I looked at this letter from uh, Dr. Rob Renenbaum. And he is putting here a letter. So he's a physician, he's a retired physician now, and he's putting this to physicians and to physician organizations, the moral obligation to alert the public as to the po possible emergence and dominant propagation of a highly virulent SARS-CoV-2 variant. Important to note in this is that Gert actually doesn't think the JN1 is the big issue, but he thinks that the, the variants that are going to occur beyond the JN1 are what is likely to be very, very dangerous. And so here is what um, Dr. Renenborn had said as well. So again, we're talking about, uh, we mentioned here the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and the fact that there's a shift in antibody production in the vaccinated cohort. They're no longer producing these virulence inhibiting um, poly non-neutralizing antibodies. But he says, when these two events occur, Highly vaccinated individuals, particularly in highly and rapidly vaccinated countries, will no longer have protection against severe disease. That is, they will no longer have the protection afforded by these antibodies. Even though they weren't able to stop the virus, they inhibited virulence. They will therefore be at great risk of severe disease and death. So that is his interpretation of what... Um, Gert was saying, and I think he find, makes a final important point here. And I, I, 
And I can understand how people, some people don't agree with Gert. Some people think that his science is not good enough. All I know is that what he predicted in terms of the variance has ex been exactly what has occurred. In terms of timing, as I said, I look at it like a volcano. How are you going to know exactly what day and what hour this is going to blow? And so from a timing point of view, I would have cautioned Gert not to give a time. Just say, essentially, this is going to happen. It may be soon based on the adjustments of the variants. But here is the final word from Dr. Renenbaum. So he makes the point, if Gert van den Bosch is correct, and I think even Gert hopes he's not correct, but he can't see how this is wrong. And he says, I think it is highly likely that he's correct. Then the general public needs and deserves a chance to prepare for such a surge. A surge. I strongly feel that it is our moral and ethical obligation as physicians and physician organizations to alert the general public to this possible surge, which is highly likely to occur, according to Gert, so that the public can proactively make anticipatory preventative plans in case such a surge does materialize. Important to note, when you're looking at any situation like this, this is about the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. It's about recognizing what are the threats. Again, I take us back to that question of the volcano, which, which Gert had alluded to. As the scientist looking at that volcano, the question becomes, at what point do you say to the community living beside the volcano that it is time to evacuate? Do you wait until the lava is coming? Or do you have to prepare them for the fact that they may need to evacuate before the lava starts to come? That's the question. That's where we are at at the moment. Where this highly virulent variant is going to come on when, I don't know. But based on everything that Gert has said, and as I said, if you trust that Gert has done the research, and I trust that he has, and I trust that based on the transition that we're seeing with the amount of cases that are occurring across the world, we are now at a point where we have to realistically think and prepare for the worst. To not do that is actually not even counterproductive. It is dangerous, it's unfair, and it doesn't help anyone. Now, some people may get very, very afraid. That's not what I think needs to happen now. But I think that we all, as societies, need to think, if the worst was to happen, what could we do? What should we do? That question is different for whole populations and very different for individuals. Many individuals ask, well, what do I do? I can't say for the individual, but I do think that there may be one last chance for people in positions of power to utilize medication that has been derided for long periods of time, but maybe because they didn't understand the mechanisms or didn't fully understand the science of the disease caused them to discount it. This is not a time for, for egos. This is a time for us to try and find solutions to try and head off what could be a large COVID er eruption with huge mortality across the world. Even now, as I reflect on Gert's statements. I hope he is wrong. I would rather for the world to laugh at him and say that he was just raising concerns unnecessarily. Because if he is right, the implications are horrific. Sorry to say this before Christmas, but please have a Merry Christmas. Thank you.